Hi, nice to meet you. Get it? Hi everyone, my name is Maya and today I am once again joined by my lovely pet gorilla, Harambe. I'm sorry vegans, but I don't think this video is for you, so um, you might want to click out if this kind of grosses you out. Today's video is about meat, the kind of meat that you cook up and you eat. Someone call me Dr. Seuss because my rhymes are fire. Oh god. Anyways, so I decided to take it upon myself to answer the question, did meat make us human? Carnivores and touters of the paleo diet will say that meat is the only thing you need to include in your diet. Protein, protein, protein. You know, to get back to our roots, we have to eat like our carnivorous ancestors, just kind of ingesting and inhaling meat at every opportunity we get because meat is what made us human, right? So let's dive into the research together to see if meat meat really changed our brains forever. So the crux of the question, does meat make us human, goes down to our brains. Humans have a very large brain for their body size, especially compared to our primate relatives. Humans have a brain size around 4.6 times greater than the brain of an average mammal. Our large brains are also very expensive to keep up and maintain. Our brain constantly requires a lot of energy from the food that we eat to maintain its function on a day-to-day -day basis. And this ties into basal metabolic rate, the amount of calories you burn as your body is performing daily functions. And what researchers have found is that even though our brains are huge, our basal metabolic rate is the same, which doesn't make any sense if you think about it, because if we have huge brains, we need to be consuming a lot of good high quality food to sustain that expensive tissue. And that brings me to a question. How did humans manage to sustain this increased brain size without a subsequent increase in their basal metabolic rate? So to answer that question, I think we need to do a little deep dive into our history. So our our closest primate ancestors, gorillas and orangutans, actually don't eat meat at all. Gorillas and orangutans are primarily frugivorous and folivorous, meaning that 99% of their diet is fruits or leaves. And if we even go back all the way to fossil apes 15 million years ago, we see that their teeth look like the teeth of a mammal that ate fruits and leaves, not an animal that ate meat. In fact, most primates don't usually eat meat because they're hard to procure, uh, they're not easy to find, and they're often rare. So how and why did this change? When did we go from a lineage of herbivorous omnivores and vegetarians to carnivores, essentially? And how did we do this? That brings me to something called the expensive brain hypothesis, a hypothesis put forth by researchers in the 1990s to try to get at and understand where the increase in human brain size comes from and tries to offset it by explaining how it could be due to the decrease or shortening of other organs in our body. So this hypothesis argues that our brains got relatively larger because our guts actually got relatively smaller, saying that the incorporation of animal foods and meat into our diet was essential because these higher quality foods required less time to digest by our smaller gut and were higher in essential nutrients like vitamin B3, zinc, and magnesium that helped our brain function properly. So so let's get into this hypothesis. Brains are very expensive organs and require a lot of work to keep up. So something had to change in our evolution to allow for our brains to get bigger, but our basal metabolic rate to stay the same. When looking at the relative size of organs between humans and other primates, these researchers noticed something in particular that stood out to them. They noticed that the mass of other organs in the human body, like the heart and kidneys, were similar to what would be expected for a human body size and when compared to other primates. But they also noticed that our gut was relatively smaller than it should be and our brain was relatively larger than it should be for our body size in comparison with other primates. So these researchers posited that this increased brain size was correlated to a reduction in our gut and small intestine. They even said that the energetic savings from reducing the gut was approximately the additional cost of having a larger brain, suggesting that a smaller gut and a bigger brain must have somehow co-evolved together. This is why our basal metabolic rate has stayed the same, because we reduced our gut so that we could increase our brain. But what about other organs like the liver, kidneys, and heart? Well, these researchers argued that it couldn't be the liver because the body relies on glucose for energy from the liver, and this is an essential function that we rely on for our daily tasks. Also, since all of our heart and its muscle is actively involved
involved in contracting and pumping oxygen rich blood to the rest of our body and draining it once it comes back. It's pretty hard to believe that any reduction in the size of the heart would actually lead to anything substantially good happening because we pretty much need all of our heart to function regularly. And lastly, a change in our kidneys would have probably not helped us because a decrease in our kidneys would have probably led to more excessive and dilute urine, which would not have been good for early humans living in dry savanna environments where they actually needed to preserve their water so that they didn't die of dehydration. Therefore, they argued that it had to be the gut because if humans started eating high quality food, you wouldn't need this whole small intestine and large intestine and cecum. These foods could be easily digestible, requiring less effort and energy expenditure by the gut, allowing for a subsequent increase in brain size. And we've even noticed trends between mammals that eat low quality foods like fruit and leaves and high quality foods like meat, tubers, and nuts. And by low quality and high quality, don't worry vegans, I'm not saying that leaves and fruits are not good for you. I'm just saying that the nutritional value of some of these leaves and fruits in these mammals diets are nowhere near as high as the nutritional value of meats, nuts, and underground tubers. So don't get your panties in a twist because you think that I'm saying that fruits aren't healthy. Eat your fruits, people. In general, mammals that eat low quality foods have large small intestines and huge guts with these huge fermenting chambers because leaves and fruits take a lot of time to digest. And so you need that extensive gut to be able to digest all of that food. Whereas carnivorous mammals that mostly eat meat have shorter and simpler guts and simpler stomachs because meat is a lot more easily digestible by the body. There's also a close relationship between relative gut size and relative brain size. Animals with large guts usually have small brains and animals with small guts usually have bigger brains on average for their body mass. So this expensive tissue hypothesis basically argues that our brains were able to increase because our guts decreased and this co-evolution allowed us to encephalize and grow bigger brains. Now note that they're not saying that a smaller gut caused a bigger brain. These researchers are just trying to explain one of the many factors as to why we have such a big brain for our body size and why our basal metabolic rate hasn't increased because of that. So what does this mean about our evolution? Over the past 4 million years, our brain size has increased from 400 to 500 cc in Australopithecines to 1400 cc in modern humans today. This hypothesis suggests that the incorporation of high quality foods like meat led to us getting bigger brains. And note for you fellow meat eaters, that doesn't mean that we were only eating meat, it just means that we were omnivorous, eating a mixture of fruits, leaves, and vegetables. Meat also requires less force to chew, which could have resulted in our more horizontally shrunken face. What we see these very horizontally projecting faces in chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas that have bigger molars and larger incisors, we have pretty tiny insignificant teeth and canines that are, let's face it, pretty unimpressive. And so if meat requires less force to chew and less masticatory effort, then that could explain why our faces have shrunk in size and why our dentition have also grown smaller. So in summary, basically the incorporation of meat alongside the incorporation of fruits and vegetables could have led to us growing bigger brains because we wouldn't have needed such an extensive gut to be able to digest all these tough plant and vegetable fibers that we were consuming. Okay, but when did carnivory appear in the human record? We know that we've come from a lineage of plant eaters and primates that mostly ate leaves and fruits. When did we shift from this vegetarian vegan diet to a omnivorous diet? Meat eating was first evidenced 2.6 million years ago, and this is because of cut marks on bones. So when humans started capturing and hunting prey, they used stone tools to kind of tear the meat away from the flesh so that they could then eat and prepare the meat. Now, when they use these stone tools to kind of cut into the animal and draw the meat away from the bone, that leaves marks on the bones of the animals. Now, these bones preserve in the fossil record, and this gives us the earliest incidence of carnivory and the fact that we were hunting and killing for prey. So many scientists have actually pointed to the fact that Homo erectus seems like a likely candidate for when we first started eating meat. The appearance of Homo erectus in the fossil record around 2 million years ago is largely considered a huge turning point in human evolution. Homo erectus
this differs from many of the earlier hominins found in our fossil record because its bones indicate that it had a relatively smaller and simpler gut, it had smaller teeth, reduced chewing muscles, larger brains, and it just started to resemble more modern human-like limb proportions. There's evidence that Homo erectus was more predatory and could have gone after and killed prey, and all these features point to the fact that Homo erectus represented a change in our evolution and a potential shift to a more carnivorous diet that resulted in these more human-like characteristics that we see today. Now this hypothesis and its conclusions sound fine and dandy, but is there any actual evidence for the expensive tissue hypothesis? So researchers decided to test this hypothesis in a species of carnivorous fish, and they actually found that this particular species that was mainly carnivorous had a reduced gut and intestine length than other fish that were not carnivorous that were also closely related. And parasite historians say that humans and hyenas were infected by the same kind of tapeworms, which suggests that they consume the same types of scavenged meaty foods. Meat is also very nutritionally dense. It's very high in vitamin B3, which is essential for metabolic function in the brain. High meat intake is correlated with intelligence, good health, and longevity. Vitamin B3 is essential in ATP or energy production in the human body, which is necessary for all the molecular and cellular processes that we need to exist on a daily basis. Having a diet high in vitamin B3 also improves your chance of survival, which would have been critical to early humans trying to survive day in and day out in a treacherous savanna environment where there was little to no water and vicious predators about. So, so far it feels like the decrease in our gut and the increase in our brain size had basically everything to do with the fact that we started eating meat right? Well, keep in mind that every hypothesis comes with caveats and criticism, and the expensive tissue hypothesis is not exempt from those two. Scientists have said that the variation in human bodies and brain size is so vast that it's impossible to just characterize it as one 65 kilo man that the researchers behind the expensive tissue hypothesis used to prove their point in their paper. This human variation would result in so many different combinations of human brain size and gut size making it impossible to draw one general conclusion from all of that information. Another scientist argued that since the Pleistocene, our body size has generally increased, arguing that this structural organization and reduction could have been the cause for our increase in brain size. Other scientists argue that this is underestimating how complex the brain is and kind of just making it about brain size instead of talking about the structural reorganization of the human brain and the individual and complex neural nuclei and tracts that make up our brain that have changed over the millions of years of our evolution. So a simplistic hypothesis cannot take into account all of this brain variation that we see. Other researchers point out that this gradual reduction in gut mass, along with a bunch of other factors like cooking, stone tool use, and a high quality diet could have over time led to an increase in brain size. So it's important to note that correlation does not imply causation. Other scientists have said that BMR can differ amongst humans by up to 17%. And other researchers have argued that if larger primates like gorillas and orangutans can afford these large gut organs in their body, then why wouldn't they be able to support larger and less costly brains? And also I want to point out that it's not just about brain size, it's also about something called corticalization, which is basically how wrinkly your brain is. Humans have a highly wrinkled and folded brain, and this is supposedly also one of the reasons why we're such a highly intelligent species. So in in summary, while the expensive tissue hypothesis does do a good job at explaining the potential relationship between a decrease in gut size and an increase in brain size, this by no means is a blanket statement that our brains got bigger because our guts shrank because we started eating meat. In fact, researchers actually looked at incidences of carnivory in the fossil record and found pretty conflicting results. They hypothesized that since Homo erectus was this turning point in human evolution where we see an increase in carnivory and the addition of meat to our our diets, that we should also see that after the arrival of Homo erectus, sites where we have fossil evidence for carnivory should see a sustained increase because we are becoming more carnivorous, right? And so they combined all this zooarchaeological data for carnivory in the fossil record before Homo erectus and after Homo erectus, and found that there was actually no sustained increase in incidences of carnivory after the appearance of Homo erectus two million years ago. So this kind of dismantles the argument that Homo erectus was 
this carnivorous hominin that was just going out and catching prey and eating meat because we don't actually see a sustained increase in carnivory after the appearance of Homo erectus, despite the fact that we supposedly started eating meat by then. Now, there was a small period of time after Homo erectus appeared that coincided with the high incidence of carnivory, but these researchers attributed it to intensive sampling, meaning that these scientists could have been more intensively sampling a certain area, thereby coming up with more evidence for carnivory. Now, personally, I'm not sure if I buy this explanation, but I decided I would just present all the information to you so that you yourself can decide, as well as always provide my references that I use for every video in the description so that you can decide what you believe. So this expensive tissue hypothesis seems to, at first glance, neatly tie everything together in terms of explaining why our brains are so big. But at a further look, it actually really doesn't take into account human variation, primate variation, differences in basal metabolic rate and body size, other factors that could have led to a bigger brain size, as well as the fact that early hominins, specifically Homo erectus, maybe weren't nearly as carnivorous as we actually thought. So let's go back to our original question. Did meat make us human? Did it permanently change our brains forever and lead to this massive increase in brain size resulting in us becoming the superior apex species allowing us to take over the entire world? Now, what do I think? Well, first of all, thank you for asking me. It's complicated. I think that the incorporation of meat into our already vegetarian diet definitely helped us because no one can deny that meat is very high in quality nutrients that nourish our brain and are easily digestible, which would make sense given our reduction in gut size over the course of our evolution. I think incorporating small quantities of meat along with a herbaceous diet definitely helped us, but by no means do I think it's what made us human and by no means do I think that it is the sole reason as to why our brains are big and why we have survived much longer than our other hominins. There's a lot of other factors that go into a bigger brain size, like what parts of the brain are being encephalicized, what different regions of the brain are becoming more wrinkled and folded, and at what rates are these turnovers happening. Cooking also plays a huge part. The invention of fire and how it allowed us to cook down these tough, hard foods into malleable and easily chewable foods is a hugely important factor as to how we were able to to eat higher quality foods as well as those tough vegetable foods because as we all know, cooking down vegetables makes them a lot easier to chew. Stone tools were also crucial in the fact that we were able to cut food into smaller pieces. Group work was also very important because the capturing and handling of prey usually required multiple hunters working in coordinated groups. So I think the notion of attributing all of our success in our history to the fact that we were eating meat kind of oversimplifies all the different factors that led to us being where we are today. Do I think meat was important in our evolution? Yeah, of course. It's high quality, nutrient dense food. There's a reason that gorillas and orangutans, our closely related primate ancestors, are nowhere near as social and cognitively capable as we are. Their diets primarily constitute low quality foods like fruits and leaves that take a lot of time to digest and store. A lot of that energy from the food that they're eating is going to support the huge amount of energy that it takes to digest that food. And as a result, this could have been one of the reasons why they weren't able to develop a larger, more encephalicized brain like humans and to a certain extent chimpanzees. In conclusion, while I do think that meat played an important part in our evolution and was potentially one of the factors that led to our bigger brains, I definitely don't think it's the only factor. I think it's one of many factors like cooking, tool use, group work, grandmothers that made us into the species that we are today. So meat eaters, you can rejoice in the fact that yeah, meat probably had a role to play in our evolution. But vegans and vegetarians, you can also be comfortable with the fact that as long as you're consuming a diet in which you're getting most of your nutrients and vitamins from the plants and vegetables and nuts that you're eating, you're probably fine. And you don't need to incorporate meat in your diet if that's not something you want to do. So at the end of the day, eat whatever you want and what makes you feel good. Because let's face it, it's not like we're facing the threat of lions, saber-toothed tigers, and woolly mammoths anymore. The biggest threat or anxiety that you've probably had to deal with all week is not handing something in before the deadline or forgetting to do a homework or assignment. You'll be just fine. 
But anyways, I hope that answers the question for any of you carnivores or paleo diet enthusiasts or vegans or vegetarians out there. Now, me and Harambe are going to go out hunting for small prey. I'm kidding, we're both vegetarian. And Harambe is strictly folivorous. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe if you want to learn more about human evolution and all things human. Comment down below what your diet is and whether you choose to eat meat or not for whatever reasons you may choose. I'd love to know more. And follow my Instagram for updates on what kinds of videos I'm making. Bye!